Okay, gonna so try gonna... try not to do that. I'm gonna try hard. <laughs> okay. Um, so that, welcome everyone to the PCDN Career Webinar for October on Fellowships and Social Change. I'm Craig Zalzer from PCD Network. Um, we're delighted to have three wonderful guests for this session today. And just a reminder, PCDN is the go-to hub for global social change. So we connect, curate, inform, and inspire global global social change community to help develop high impact social change careers. Um, and our career series has been an entire year where each month we have a different thematic focus on building a career in change. So as you might know, this month is all about fellowships. Um, Yay! Um, <laughs> this month is sponsored by the Rotary Peace Fellowship Program, which is amazing, wonderful, incredible. Um, so if you don't know it, I highly encourage you to check it out. Um, I've taught in the program many times, and Susan is the representative at Duke University for the Rotary Peace Center there, and she'll talk a lot about the mm -hmm. fellowship. Yeah. Um, while we're chatting, we're using the Zoom platform. So for our listeners, you can look towards the bottom of your screen and click on chat, and you can put in any questions or comments you might have. Um, please also let us know where you're calling in from at any time. And if you're only calling in on a cell phone, 100% okay, we don't want to discriminate whether you're you know, landline, cellular, or computer. Um, we'll have a completely open session for the second half, so you can turn on your mic on your cell phones and ask any questions. Um, this session is being recorded again, so mm -hmm. just if you say anything incredibly controversial that you say, I'll never take a fellowship from this particular donor, and you regret that, <laughs> you're on, just let us know, and we can actually edit it out. Um, I, don't, I don't think this is going to be a controversial session. Mm -hmm. And just, just the format for today, so Laura and Eileen will each speak for a few minutes talking about the wonderful opportunities that IIE has, but also their recommendations for how do you develop a competitive fellowship application, how do you find the right fellowship. Susan's going to talk about her extensive experience with the Rotary Peace Fellowship Program and also her insights from her career. I'll talk for a few minutes, and then we'll just open it up to general questions, discussions, comments. Um, so if I read each speaker's bio, we'd be here for the entire session, so I will not do that because that would take much too long. But I'm very grateful they've taken time out of their busy schedules to share their wisdom with all of us and our future community that's going to be watching online. Um, so we'll start off with Laura and Eileen. So Laura is the Outreach and Recruitment Manager for the Institute of International Education. And I'll say this very strongly, if you have not heard of IIE, you know, that's their abbreviation, it is the world's leading educational exchange organization, and they have more fellowships that they administer than anyone in the world. So that's <laughs> important to be going to look at fellowships, regardless of your citizenship and all the tools they have. Um, she worked at Bard College as Associate Dean of Students um, and has, you know, in, she also serves as a Fulbright Program Advisor, which is a wonderful leading fellowship program. I was a Fulbrighter. And she works with 1,500 college and universities across the country with their advisors. And then Eileen is the lead alumni relations program coordinator at IIE. So she helps coordinate and cajole and bring together a global community of over almost 30,000 participants from 150 different programs. And she also holds an MA in public policy from Central European University, my alma mater as well, another great place to look for fellowships or degree programs. Um, and I'll, do, I'll introduce Susan now as well. So Susan is the manage, managing director of the Duke U University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill Rotary Peace Center. So it's a very interesting hybrid between a public and a private university. She was named the managing director of the center in 2015, but has been working there since 2005. And she has 20 years experience working in humanitarian programming around the world. Um, also, the uh, interesting tidbit about Susan, she helped sell Julia Child's house in... <laughs> In Massachusetts, a little bit of, tidbit of information. The famous, so maybe, you can, maybe you can connect that to fellowships. <laughs> Not and, sure. <laughs> um, and again, we're about to get started, but while and I think in terms of people calling in so far, we have Catalina and myself from the PCN team in Alexandria, Alta from New York, who expressed interest in learning about the Pickering Wrangle and Pain Fellowship. Um, we have Catherine from Texas, also interested in Pickering and Pain Fellowship. And we have a bunch of other people who haven't chatted in where they're calling in from. So please let us know via the chat function what city or country you're calling from, what questions you have about fellowships. And I think, so to start off, I'll turn it over to Laura and Eileen, if they can share a little bit about IE and their tips for being competitive fellowship applicant and finding the right fellowship. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. First, thank you so much for having us. We're, we're so excited about this series in general, and obviously we here at IIE are big fans of um, international exchange and, uh, and social change through, through international connections. Um, IIE is going into its 
now second hundred a year, right? Two, we're going into um, and mm -hmm. has, our centennial and has been around um, since, since its inception to really increase the um, the exchange between folks in the U.S. and, and folks over overseas. Um, so we administer over 40 different programs. So we hope that you haven't checked out IIE for some opportunities that you will be inclined to do so. Um, a lot of those are um, externally sponsored. So we work with private corporations and foundations. We work with the U.S. government, the Department of Defense, the Department of State. Um, Lots of public-private uh, partnerships. So there's a, we have kind of a wide range of of grant opportunities, um, ranging from very very large programs like the Fulbright program that you may have heard about, um, to smaller programs for um, in, children of employees of particular countries or or privately funded organizations as as well. So there's a lot of um, kind of movement happening through IIE, and we certainly hope that you'll start to get familiar with with us. But in addition to administering scholarships and fellowships, IIE also um, does a lot in terms of thought leadership and educational um, in, in educational exchange. So we run the Open Doors um, survey, which which tracks both U.S. citizens going abroad and foreign students coming to the U.S. So if you are interested in international exchange more more broadly or doing research on that, we hope you'll kind of utilize some other thought leadership that IIE uh, has around around those those programs. Um, so we work with candidates from um, the, the initial stage of, of learning about programs all the way through the participant experience, and then uh, and then in the alumni capacity as well to make sure that people are continuing to stay connected to each other, to the host communities that they've uh, participated with, um, and to the programs more more generally. So, uh, yeah. did, I, did I miss anything there? I think you covered pretty much the whole gamut of what IE does, and my role with alumni and what I'm most interested in is helping the participants once they've finished their experience to be able to articulate uh, how their experience uh, impacted them personally, professionally, and academically, especially uh, translating that to employers yeah. to show how it, it's a very impactful thing uh, in their career. Absolutely. Um, and regardless of the length of one of these experiences, we do hope that, that participants consider themselves alum and engaged with the program kind of long after that. And, and those of you who are on the webinar probably know or are, or are aware or are thinking about the kind of networks that one builds. So the, these scholarships and fellowships are designed to provide you with the, you know, several months or a year or multiple, multi, multi year um, experience that we hope adds to your personal and professional growth. But then you join a, a, a group of alumni um, and that kind of continues on through the remainder of your career. You kind of always have this on your resume or your CV. Um, so this is a really nice way to get and stay connected with other folks who are um, making it a priority to include some kind of international or change seeking um, scholarship or fellowship as part of their of their program of study. Um, so we, given that IIE administers over 40 programs, we're not going to talk specifically about um, any kind of one various component. But we do want to give you some kind of general tips for searching um, for, for scholarships and fellowships that might um, be right for you, and also then some, some general tips for, for applying. Um, and Craig, you'll just have to like cut me off game okay. show style, because okay, um, I, will, I will talk and talk here about, about this. Um, the first thing that I really want to encourage people to, to do is do a little bit of a self-inventory about yourself. So think about um, academically, professionally, um, personally, what makes you tick, right? What is really interested, interesting to you? What are the kind of breadcrumbs that you have left yourself throughout your, your academic career or personal career or professional career? Um, and where you might want to expand that. Um, one of the very, there are a lot of opportunities out there. There's a lot of funding available. People want to give you money, um, which is a nice thing about the world. Um, but you do need to match your skills and interests with the appropriate grant opportunity. So I think first and foremost, you want to be thinking about what is it that I am looking to achieve out of this, out of this year? Is this for me a mainly professional experience? Is it a mainly kind of network building? Is it um, an academic uh, uh, endeavor that I'm interested in? Am I kind of interested in, in um, seeing more broadly and really looking for this to give me some direction? Or do I have a very specific thing that I want to be able to, to do? Um, and then you're going to want to start to think about, um, especially if, in international context, what skills and experiences are you bringing to this with regard to language, prior experience abroad? Um, do, have you had the opportunity to study or work abroad in the, in the past? If so, are you interested in continuing to work with those communities, or are you interested in diving into a new world region um, or, or 
um, or, or international community um, to broaden out your, your skills and experience in that way. Are you interested in going to a country where you already speak the language um, or where you might need to be able to operate in English or is language acquisition kind of one of the main goals for you in, in spending time overseas? So really starting to clarify some of the objectives that you have for yourself in addition to what has been the major kind of themes throughout your, throughout your experience and, and work. Um, I think the wonders of the internet um, can be both great and daunting when you are trying to narrow down what you want to be applying for and what you want to be looking at. Um, so certainly some great Google searches um, are going to, to be helpful here, but I would also really encourage people to get in touch with their alma maters through your alumni office um, to see if there is an office of scholarships and fellowships on, on campus. Um, many, many colleges are starting this process of, of having offices of scholarships and fellowships, so it might not have been a reality while you were on campus or while you are on campus. Um, but the, the things kind of pop up. So if you are not familiar, um, and I should say that many offices of scholarships and fellowships on college campuses are eager to work with their alums in this process. Um, so if they're not already connected with the Alumni Association, um, that's kind of an, an excellent way to, to stay connected and, to, and to, get, um, to get some additional kind of support. Now, even if you are um, to kind of going at this process on your on your own, there are some additional kind of resources and things you're going to want to be aware of. Each a scholarship or fellowship will traditionally lay out for you some best practices about applying for their for their award. Um, some scholarships and fellowships will provide you with um, with es sample essays of examples of successful applications. Um, others will provide kind of general tips. Um, webinar series, I, I know most scholarships and fellowships now are doing a series of webinars throughout their competition cycle um, for you to be able to dial in and ask questions. So even if you're not working with somebody affiliated with the college campus, you can get advice directly from the, from the program staff. Um, I would kind of caution or maybe just, just put out there that grant writing is a particular breed of writing. It is not your traditional academic paper, nor is it your personal kind of your, your nonfiction work. Um, it's you know kind of somewhere in the somewhere in the middle, but being able to articulate your story, your vision, your um, research project. Sometimes these these grants can get very complicated or complex and you have to remember who the readers are and and what you know what you need to convey in that Absolutely. So one of the things you're going to want to do when you are thinking about applying for an award is very much so think about who the readership is. Um, you want to think about the individual award stipulations, certainly, but then you also want to situate that within a larger context of the award more generally, right? Um, so is the organization that's offering it, um, do they have particular overarching values or goals that are stated on their website um, that hopefully I think will, will relate to the scholarship or fellowship that you're applying for, um, but how do you kind of incorporate that, that in? Another thing to pay attention to and to be thinking about in the writing of your application is the leadership. How are these applications being reviewed? Um, who is going to be doing that, doing that reading? Um, how many layers of review are there? And, and I think that grant writing is an excellent opportunity to practice um, writing for multiple audiences. For many of our scholarships and fellowships, there is a two-step review process. You don't get the application back between those stages. Um, so you need to be thoughtful on the onset about how you are presenting yourself and presenting yourself to two different audiences um, who have the same overarching goal, but who might have different sets of, of uh, distinguished priorities when they are when they're looking into it. Um, so we want to we want you to kind of be thoughtful about aligning your interests and values and skills with the correct opportunity, understanding um, in the application process who you are writing. For, um, and taking advantage of resources that the, the scholarship or fellowship or organization may provide to you in, um, in completing an, an application. For those of you who are able to stay connected with college campuses, I would say that another really great resource in addition to the scholarships and fellowships offices is obviously the writing center on campus, your academic dean, um, the alumni office can sometimes be helpful with connections or hooking you up with other people from your institution who have won similar awards. Um, so starting to kind of think about your networks that already exist as they relate to your future steps and what you may be, and what you may be interested in. Um, I'm trying to think. What have what have we missed? Uh, when to, when to start applying, right? <laughs> yep. Um, 
now, early, always. <laughs> um, no, <laughs> as early as possible. Yeah, I think I think it is important. Obviously, each scholarship and fellowship sets its own deadline. Um, spoiler alert: many of them are in the early fall. Um, so this is a process that, if you are thinking about, you do need to be kind of uh, getting your bearings early. Um, most scholarships and fellowships will require letters of recommendation. Some require letters of invitation from someone within the host country. I'm thinking about Fulbright specifically there. Um, so you want going to want to get get started on these applications early, as they do um, sometimes have components which are outside of your control. Um, so being able to kind of identify uh, the timelines and working backwards from from there um, to be able to get a, a head start. I will say that with most scholarships and fellowships, the amount of writing that you're going to be asked uh, to do is not extensive. Um, uh, but it does need to be very, very well crafted. So while traditionally we're not talking about a huge volume, um, we are talking about a very, very well crafted and edited um, set of documents. I would say the most time consuming part is actually narrowing it down. So getting it all on paper and then narrowing it down and condensing it. Because with Fulbright, for example, you can only write two pages. <laughs> and one and a half to two pages. Two pages, right? yep. Yep. So it's you have to condense, and that's the hardest part. And and I think also this the process of, of condensing down um, the writing can can be really helpful to you in solidifying your own process um, and thinking about again what is it in my past experience which is most relevant to the award that's being offered. You all are dynamic and diverse uh, a group of people and have a lot of experiences that if you just put on paper may look like this, right? But what, and, oh, for those of you on the phone, I'm spreading my fingers out wide to show <laughs> multiple different directions. Um, but for, but in, a, in, a, in a, a scholarship and fellowship application, you need to be telling a cohesive narrative. And I think that that is one of the most difficult parts of this, that you need to find the central thread of the, the research that you're going to be doing, the teaching you're going to be doing, the, the public policy work, whatever it is that the grant is going to entail, and then telling your story to um, kind of foster and support that that overarching narrative. Um, ideally, by the time we get through reading an application, we say, of course, this person is interested in doing this thing, right? So you're you're knitting together your personal and professional interests um, in a way that makes sense. Your the, hopefully your letters of recommendation are also kind of pointing us down this this one cohesive path. Um, so you do want to make sure that you are kind of honing your vision. And I do, I think like Aileen mentioned, um, trying to narrow things down can be one of the hardest, the hardest things. I always encourage applicants when they are writing an application to go through kind of sentence by sentence and say, does this, what are the central themes of my application? What am I proposing to do? And does this sentence support or divert from that overarching mission, right? And if it, if it diverts, either you need to change it or you need to take it out um, because you are not given a tremendous amount of space and anything you are providing for us does need to be in, in a cohesive um, a narrative towards why you should be funded to do this, to do this award. Um, okay. All right. <laughs> did, we hit all of the, did we hit all of the points here? <laughs> I think all the... I'll, I'll add one more thing. Don't forget that a lot of these scholarships and grants are stackable, whether it be, you know, following on with the Gilman Scholarship to get a Fulbright afterwards, our panelists love to see that. Yep. Um, but also, you can get a Born and Gilman at the same time. So just do your research and realize that you can do these things all at once yes. as well. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, so that, thank you very much. I think you should put that on the IE website as like, concise I, I think I, I think I had 14 steps only I ran out of space for typing but 14 <laughs> steps we had to do for kind of being competitive fellowship applicants um I think you, you want to add anything else no um, no we're happy to happy to answer questions if there are but but I, I know we've been monopolizing time so far okay. good um so we have a couple more people who called in not everyone we have someone from Ghana Houston, New York, DC, and other places. And so Susan, I'm gonna turn it over to you just to say, so the Rotary Peace Fellowship, I mean, they are the sponsor, but I'm not saying this because they're the sponsor of this period. <laughs> is like, it's really Rotary is a, a service organization that also is celebrating its just about 100th anniversary, I think. Yeah, this um, year. So this mm -hmm. is, this hey. is like time to have two centurion yeah. organizations, but, yeah. um, but the Rotary yeah. Rotarians is the largest service member organization in the world, doing incredible work in health and other mm -hmm. sectors. And peace has always been one of their core areas, and they have created the Rotary Peace Fellowship, which Susan can tell you much more about. But I really think of it as the equivalent of the Rhodes or the Marshall or the Fulbright Fellowship for Peace. Mm 
Um, it's amazing. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And so Susan's going to convince you all why you should think about applying. <laughs> I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Um, so as he said, I, I'm the managing director of the Peace Center at Duke University and the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And today when I'm talking, I'm really representing all of the, um, the entire program, which is a program of Rotary International. And the program has six uh, Rotary Peace Centers around the world. And besides our center in the US, there are centers partnering with universities in Japan, England, Sweden, and Australia, where the Rotary um, Peace Fellowships are awarded for master's level studies. And then 10, um, 10 fellowships per year are awarded at each of those um, centers. And then there's a sixth uh, center in Thailand where 50 fellowships are awarded each year for a three month certificate program. And like most fellowship programs, the Rotary Peace Fellowship has a particular focus. And in our case, it's for academic studies in the field of peace building and conflict resolution. And other um, programs may focus more on leadership and social change agents. Um, and I'm thinking there of like the Acumen Fellowship. Others may support social entrepreneurs um, to focus on solving a problem, such as the Ashoka Fellowship. And other fellowships may focus on a specific field, um, such as the Environmental Defense Fund Climate Corps Fellowships. And then there are still others that may be regionally focused, such as the Young African Leaders Initiative. Um, and I think that um, Eileen and Laura talked about this, but you really need to think about what you're looking for as you consider what your next career steps are. And, so do you want to enhance your work um, experience by developing a specialization? Do you want to develop leadership skills? Um, is a graduate degree important to your future career plans? And all of these are questions that you should ask yourself as you develop and investigate um, fellowship opportunities. And so just to give an, the example of the Rotary Fellowship program. This program is looking for early to mid career professionals who have a demonstrated interest in peace building and or conflict resolution. And in our program, we define um, peace very broadly. So if you've been working with a grassroots development organization on poverty reduction or um, you know, working on national security, perhaps with a government, your government, or maybe as a health professional on rural health projects, you may be a really good candidate for the Rotary Peace Fellowship. Um, we do require a minimum of three to five years of relevant work experience um, for the master's program and a minimum of five years for the certificate program. And while I am not going to even begin to know all the requirements for the many, many fellowship programs out there, um, I imagine the advice I'm about to give would be relevant <laughs> to most of them. And as, um, as my colleagues at IE um, have just said, there are a lot of fellowships out there and Google is your friend. So search <laughs> um, extensively and carefully. And once you've identified a few fellowship opportunities that seem to fit well with your goals, read and research each of them really carefully. Um, and here, these are a few things that I think you should pay attention to. Um, when is the application deadline? What is the time frame of the fellowship? And you know, when thinking of the time frame, you want to think about what, how much time you actually have to devote to this. Um, I mean, just the the Rotary Peace Fellowship, you know, has a certificate program that's three months. It has um, there's one master's program that is 15 months, another one that's 18 months, and then all the rest of the programs are um, two years. And so you need to kind of think about how much time you have to, um, that you want to devote to this. What are the application requirements? Um, and does the fellowship have any specific requirements or expectations that might impact whether it's right for you? So for example, um, there are fellowships that will require you to return home to your home country for a specific period of time once you've completed the fellowship. So, um, you know, does that work for you? Um, for example, with the Rotary Peace Fellowship, 
it, this is funded by Rotarians, and there is an expectation that Rotary Peace Fellows are committed to the goals and values of Rotary International, um, which, as Craig mentioned, is a, is a really big service organization. And fellows are expected to speak at Rotary Club events, um, and many will go on to actually become Rotarians you know, at some point down the road after they've um, completed the program. Financial support may also be really important um, to you as you investigate. So um, pay attention to the details of the support so you understand exactly what um, is covered. And this could be really important, for example, if you have a family, because most fellowship programs are not going to provide additional support um, to family members. So once you've identified um, a couple of fellowships that might seem to make sense to you, do further research search, and then contact um, some former fellows from the program. And it sounds like Eileen, for example, works with um, alumni from various programs that they are um, dealing with. So, you know, I think reaching out to alumni who have completed a fellowship program really will help you decide whether this opportunity is right for you and um, and then they may have application tips that could be really helpful. So I do have some thoughts on how to make an application competitive. Um, first of all, I think you wanna really understand what all the details of the program um, before you start out um, with your application. I think that's really a critical thing. So your knowledge of the program is really gonna be obvious to those of us who might be reviewing your application. A sponsoring organization is one, will select fellows who are going to get the most out of an opportunity and offer the most to the organization. So just taking again the Rotary Peace Fellowship as an example, um, our application asks specifically for an essay that outlines why an applicant has selected a particular Rotary Peace Center for their studies. And um, as, an, you know, as someone who is reading um, applications for who apply to Duke or the University of North Carolina, um, it's really clear to me when an applicant has actually researched our two universities and can explain why our program makes sense based on their past experiences and future career goals. I really like to read applications where I can see why a Rotary Peace Fellowship at our center makes perfect sense for an applicant. Um, such an essay is gonna definitely catch my atten attention. And the opposite is also true, because I am not <laughs> going to be impressed if an applicant tells me that they wanna study at Duke University because they've always wanted to attend a university in the United States. Um, that just is not gonna make <laughs> sense to me. Um, so, and then, then another tip is don't be too modest. Um, and I say this especially to the non-Americans who might be listening to this. Um, you, your application is your best chance to convince um, reviewers that you are the be their best choice. And if you're too modest, you lose the opportunity to tell us why we should select you. Um, so really talk about um, your accomplishments, um, you know, what, what's important to you. These, these are things um, that will catch our attention. Um, in terms of when you should apply, um, just to go along with what my colleagues um, at IE said, again, understanding the process is really important because some applications, um, fellowships may have a rolling admission so you can apply anytime, but others are going to have strict deadlines with quite a few components. Um, so allow yourself plenty of time to create, complete an excellent application. You know, if in your research you discover the perfect um, fellowship, but the deadline is actually the day after tomorrow, chances are you're really not going to do a good job um, with the application. So, for example, with the Rotary Peace Fellowship, um, there are some key steps involved, and one of these is securing an endorsement from a Rotary district, and there are 500 and 20-something Rotary districts around the world. And 
but anyone applying for the fellowship needs to allow probably a couple of months in order to get everything together, including this endorsement, so that you can submit a complete um, and strong application by the deadline. Um, I guess my final thoughts would be that there really are a lot of fellowships out there, and I think the number seems to be growing. Um, and the number of people applying for them is also growing. So there, you know, many of them are very competitive. So think realistically about whether a specific fellowship is right for you. It's much easier to put together a strong and competitive application when it's clear that you fit the fellowship criteria and goals really well. So. Okay, thank you very much, Susan. Um, so uh, this is a lot of wonderful advice. Um, while, while you were talking, we had a couple other people call in and ask questions. So we have Boston, Ghana, Texas, New York, Virginia, North Carolina. I'm, I'm gonna just make three comments because I wanna hear questions from the users and listeners. Um, so the first thing is, I think as Eileen, um, Laura, and Susan have said, is don't be humble, but also don't be egotistical. And the way I like to <laughs> is an application should show that your entire life has destined you for this opportunity without being egotistical. And that doesn't mean going back to kindergarten, but it has to be a compelling, compelling way of showing your professional and academic experience and what the fellowship offers. There's a logical connection and also post-fellowship. So for example, if you want, I had a Boren fellowship, I had a Fulbright fellowship, you know, I had to make a case why that country, why that particular language. You can't just say, there's a fellowship opportunity in China, I wanna to go to China. If you have no evidence of East Asia, of Mandarin or Cantonese, like, there has to be a logical connection. And you have to make it as clear as possible because the readers will, if you don't make it clear, they're gonna get frustrated and just ignore you. Um, so, because I, re I review a lot of fellowship applications. So, so be humble, modest, eager, you know, but find the right branding and the right mm -hmm. framing of your experience. And, and don't tell your whole life story. Like find the right three components or four mm -hmm. components. Second thing is having been a referee or refer many times for my students, um, it's very important to ask, think about who you're gonna ask to provide references and make it as mm -hmm. easy as possible for that professor or employer and ask months in advance, give them everything they need. I really mean this like a month in advance, your very strong essay that's fully edited and almost perfect. Um, some professors will ask you to write draft recommendations which I've done many times. And I'll tell you a funny story. When I, when I got a Fulbright Fellowship, I wrote one of the recommendations. I don't know if this is okay to tell, you know, 25 years later. Um, you know, and, you know, and, and the person whose name was in, what got the feedback, that was one of the best recommendation letters they had ever received. I, I wrote it in her name I mean, she edited it. It's like, you have to understand how to write a letter. Because if I ask a student to write a letter for me, it's not a good letter. It, it's harder for me, for me to make it a great letter. Um, and then the third thing is become a fellowship machine. Um, and what that means is like, if you're gonna apply for one fellowship, it's almost not worth it. Because often there's 10 to 20 to 100 applications or applicants per fellowship. So start doing your research early and find three to five fellowships to 10 that fit your interests that you would be competitive for. And once you've applied for one and done it well and gotten feedback from all the, the different, your peers and mentors, then it gets easier to do the next one and the next one and be prepared to be rejected. Um, so I've actually, I, I was the Boren Fellowship Advisor at Georgetown for nine years. Um, you know, and actually made some of my students cry, not because I'm mean, but they would come in and be like, here's my draft. And I, I wouldn't, I would just say this is, I, would, I wouldn't say it meanly, I'd say like, this needs a lot of work and they'd be devastated. But the, one, the ones who work through that often would get the fellowship. So it's like, be prepared to work with mentors, get the feedback, be rejected. And if you're diligent and have the qualifications, often you can get one, but it's the people who apply for one last minute and don't put in the effort often will not get it. Mm -hmm. so, so that's, I don't want to talk anymore. I mean, I, I will say I had a Fulbright fellowship for two years, a Boren fellowship, a fellowship at CEU. Um, I review a lot of fellowship applications and I don't think the reason I get, got fellowships is because I'm smart, it's because I had great mentors. And the whole reason I applied for a Fulbright is this mentor said you should apply for it and I listened to her. So you have, having mentors who can help guide you the right fellowship applications mm -hmm. is important. Um, so I'm gonna start reading some of the questions here and then you know, as we're going through this, please feel free to type in your questions, comments, or resources. Or if you wanna turn on your mic or your video, you can do that. So we had a couple of questions. I don't know if any, the three of you have any insights to, to, between the Pickering, the Wrangle, and the Pain fellowships. I mean, those are all administered by different organizations, so mm -hmm. you can feel free to pass but someone just, Alta, wanted to know, how do you decide which one to apply for? 
Um, so those, those are all master's level fellowships for U.S. citizens to do grad school and then pursue usually in the State Department or USAID. So any, right. any thoughts on those? I'm afraid I don't, I don't know about that, but hopefully the others do. <laughs> <laughs> um, because those are not administered by IIE, I can't uh, speak on those in any kind of official capacity. Um, this is where I would really encourage applicants to um, utilize the resources and the networks that they're already connected with. So fellowships advisors on campuses, your faculty advisors that you've worked with, um, uh, again, kind of reaching out, as Susan said, to alums of the program, uh, many fellowships, um, and I don't want to speak for these, these three because, again, I don't, I don't know about them specifically, um, will provide uh, in for contact information for their alums. Some even have a core of alumni ambassadors who are trained to speak with, with potential applicants about the, about the program. Um, the other thing to think about is, do you have to decide which one, or can you be throwing your hat into multiple, um, into multiple fellowships baskets, mm -hmm. which is something that I would certainly encourage. As Craig mentioned, there are lots of opportunities out there. You get better writing these applications the more you do. Um, and there are a number of applications which do have kind of overlapping criteria, right? Be it graduate school admission or re a research a teaching component. Um, so if you are finding multiple fellowships which meet your requirements and there isn't a conflict of interest of applying for multiple, um, I would say you want to kind of hone in on the ones which best uh, meet your, your long-term objectives, but don't feel like you have to limit yourself to just applying to one. Okay. Yeah, and if you do feel like you want, you should carefully do an analysis of whether you want to work for USAID for a certain number of years, whether you want to work for uh, the US State Department for a certain number of years, as as someone working in an embassy abroad, you I had an intern that actually applied for the Pickering and got it, but she turned it, it's an amazing program, but she turned it down because she decided she didn't um, want to work in an embassy abroad. Right. So just, yeah, really evaluate your long-term goals. And I think Susan's point about the kind of time requirements of the fellowships, um, that plays into both the length of the experience itself, and then also if there is any kind of add-on or service or work mm -hmm. component that is going to be required of you afterwards, because that is an important thing to, to keep in mind, and you don't want to be accepting a scholarship or fellowship um, that you are not able to fully meet the commitments upon return or upon completion of the of the degree program or the, or the experience itself. Because then they do actually make you pay back the money. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> but but none, of the pe none of the people on this call are responsible for asking for the money back, so. Um, right, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so there's a question from Boston. Um, what is the perception that, that admission committees have when a candidate's already had other fellowships? Would that make them le less competitive or more competitive? And I know you, you addressed that before, but anyone want to take that on? Susan, do you, want, do you want to start or do you want me to start? Go ahead and start and I'll add on yeah. anything. Ab absolutely. So I think that there's no, um, there's no distinct answer to that, to that question. If you have had past, the, the way that fellowships applications work is about how you are telling your story. So you may have had a, a slew of other scholarships and fellowships, but if you're not connecting that in to what it is you're going to be doing on your grant, then it's not of relevance to us. Um, on the other on the other side, you may have had a scholarship or fellowship experience that doesn't on on the face of it look like it has anything to do with what you're doing, but the way that you tell your story is really important to us in identifying, okay, how are past experiences playing into your decision to want to want to undertake this um, this experience at this phase of your of your career. So I would certainly say um, that that for a lot of programs, there's no bias if you've already had them, but it's not going to give you an, an extra points unless you tell us about how that experience is relevant to the experience that you're undertaking now. Um, and I should say, certainly for Fulbright and Bourne and Gilman, um, it's not a requirement that you've had any, any past, either international experience or fellowships or, or scholarships in the past. For a lot of people, these sometimes are their first distinguished awards, and that's absolutely fine with us as, as well. So I think it's less about the number of lines on your CV or your resume and more about how you're telling us your story. Um, so I, you know, I would look at somebody with a great, a CV full of, of past uh, scholarships and fellowships, but unless they're main, making a connection about how those are relevant to their to their the experience they're applying for with us, it that doesn't really kind of give give them any any leg up in the application process. Yeah, you have to connect the dots, and one 
one other piece of advice I would give to you is to have somebody that doesn't know you at all, doesn't really know your background and how um, your past experiences connect with your future goals, read your essays and read your CV to see if they can understand how these dots are connected. You know, if you used to do, um, you know, recycling research in Vietnam, how does that connect with the Fulbright that you want to do in Bosnia? Um, you really have to these people don't know your background and you really have to tell that story really well. I think the same thing can be said um, because we, I mean, I, I oversee um, selection for the fellowship in within the context of the Duke UNC Peace Center. And we do have people applying um, sometimes who already have a master's degree. Um, you know, it's not unheard of that they might even have already two master's degrees. And if that's not, if there's no explanation of it all, at all of why another master's degree makes sense, um, then chances are we're not going to be looking at, at it very favorably. However, it the reason that for the applicants doing that and, and applying for this may make perfect sense. And so, you know, again, um, explain things and, and make this part of your um, story and how, you know, you've arrived at this point and this is why this opportunity makes sense for you. Um, so two questions. So one is just the nuts and bolts of how many applications are you seeing among you know, Rotary's one fellowship or two fellowships, and I in ministers 40 plus. But what's the normal ratio? Is it you know, 20 applications for each spot? Um, and then a second question, just really kind of focused more on PCN, is too many people I think of fellowships as a purely academic endeavor. And so yes, they can be great for masters or PhD or postdoc, but one of the things I really wanna convey is fellowships can be an integral part of building a career at all stages. So just any wisdom from the Rotary or IIE or just fellowships in general, like how, how can we encourage more people to see fellowships as a path to skills development and not just research? So maybe let's start with um, Susan, if you're ready, then go. Sure. Um, yes. Well, in fact, I would say that um, our fellowship does not really fo focus so much on research. I mean, I think most, certainly most um, Peace Fellows who are involved in, in, part of the master's um, fellowships are going to do a thesis, um, a master's thesis, and they would be doing some research. But ideally, there also, there is a, you know, certainly at Duke UNC, we have a strong um, professional development component um, so that we are um, working with, with fellows during their two years um, with us on Speaking of grant writing, we do grant writing workshops. We do public speaking workshops. We have um, two kind of mini courses that deal with leadership development. Um, and so there's, there's a strong professional development um, component. A lot of the fellows that come into our center specifically are, um, uh, you know, are at the kind of I don't want to say early career because that's not the case, but you know, I don't think that a 28 year old is really what I would call mid career, but let's say late early to mid career. Um, you know, the, the average age of um, peace fellows, I think across the board um, for the master's program is early thirties. And, um, but you know, in general, it was sort of between say 27 and, and um, 40. And, um, they are generally going to be looking for more than just very theoretical um, studies. So we like to, you know, think that we are providing them with um, skills development, whether it's through, you know, negotiation skills, um, grant writing skills, um, public speaking skills, but we, um, we really do try to be practically focused so that it's career development, um, not, you know, not a master's degree that looks good on paper, but doesn't actually give you project management skills that your next job is going to ask you to have. Um, Eileen or Laura? 
Yeah, ab absolutely. So I think that, that this is one of the aspects where you are going to want to identify what it is that you're hoping to get out of the experience. Mm -hmm. And then looking kind of, at, as Susan was talking about, about the whole picture about what you're, what you're doing. I'm going to talk about Fulbright, for example. There are kind of three main tracks within, within Fulbright. You can get a master's degree, you can do independent research, or you can teach English abroad. Um, so obviously the teaching English abroad has kind of a more career focus, although you don't have to plan to be an educator long term to be competitive in that, in that program. Program. I know a lot of people do the, do the teaching program because they don't have an academic project or feel like graduate school is right for them, but can find ways that teaching English overseas for a year is going to enhance their soft skills, um, give them professional development opportunities, speaking in front of a, a group, working in high stress situations, translation, right? All of those things, which can be very important to the, to the job market. So I think um, thinking about the entire experience and what you may get out of it, rather than just kind of what is on paper is is really important. Um, I would also say that, that within larger scholarships and fellowships, you're going to want to do a little bit of a deep dive. Um, with Fulbright, for example, we're seeing more and more opportunities for internships to be part of your experience, either as kind of a community engagement, add on to one of the other aspects that we just talked about, or Mexico now does a binational internship award where the entire um, kind of purpose of your grant is to intern at a, at a, a Mexican company for the duration of the year. Austria has a, a program um, that is a joint award, so you're teaching part of the time and then doing a, um, a kind of a, a service project or an internship as, as part of that. Um, we have a grant in Germany for emerging journalists um, where your placement, you are with a, it can be print journalism or, or multimedia journalism, um, and you are again kind of interning and getting professional experiences. So it may also be um, behoove you to kind of look at um, the, the wide range of opportunities and, and go back to some things that you may not ostensibly think in, includes what you might be interested in um, as, you're, as you're moving forward. Um, I want to address the, the numbers question because I think it does come up and, and the answer that you're going to get for each program is it depends. Um, it depends on where, if you're coming inbound to the U.S. or going outbound, it depends on which country you're, you're going to. Um, for some uh, scholarships and fellowships, it depends on where in the world you're applying from. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about Rhodes particularly and having quotas about where in the U.S. applicants can come from. Um, so those are all things you're going to want to look into. Many scholarships and fellowships will publicize on their website their statistics. Um, again, this is not somewhere where I want you all to start. Um, with Fulbright, for example, we operate in 140 different countries. So we receive over 10,000 applications annually for about 2,000 awards. So if you're breaking down the numbers, it's one in five. Um, but if you look more specifically, um, obviously U.S. Uh, English, I'm sorry, English-speaking countries are much more competitive for us. Uh, Western Europe tends to be much more competitive. So if you're looking at, at programs outside of the English-speaking world um, or Western Europe, your, your odds are going to go up kind of depending on, on what you're applying for. Um, but again, I would caution people to be applying for the thing that they feel like they can make the strongest case for rather than the thing where the numbers look the best. A well-placed and well-reasoned application in a more competitive pool is a better use of your time than a weak application in a, in a less competitive pool. Um, I'll speak for Fulbright, and I don't want to speak for any, anybody else here, but if we don't get qualified applicants, we won't fill the spots that we have. Um, just because we get an application doesn't mean that we're going to award a grant. It has to be the right fit for that grant. Um, so again, be an informed consumer, understand the numbers, but don't let that be where you're starting when you're looking for awards. Um, and it really don't let it kind of dictate um, where you are applying um, on top, more, than, more than your interest, um, skills, and experience. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to add on a few things. At least with the alumni ambassador programs, I've found that some of the best alumni ambassadors have admitted to me that they, re for both Fulbright yeah. and Gilman, they didn't get it the first time and then they reapplied again. Yeah. Because they had grit and they, they tried again. Tenacity. Tenacity. <laughs> so even, so the numbers game, I would just, you know, with Fulbright, you can look at, if you're a U.S. participant wanting to go abroad, you can look at, you know, which countries have you know, more spots, you can kind of finagle that, but also at the same time, just grit helps reapplying again. Um, and then I also wanted to add in related to uh, transferable skills to employers, what we found is that these experiences, for example, the Fulbright TA program, students and participants gain immeasurable uh, transferable skills, but it's the gap is, is uh, relaying that information to employers. In, in a way that's meaningful for them. So really just think 
think about what you gained while abroad um, during your experience. Like, for example, if you were a Fulbright ETA and you helped manage, you know, a huge caseload of, uh, you know, you did some sort of project management while abroad, think of how you should relay that to employers on a resume for an office management position. Just think about what you're trying to go for, because that's, that's where we found uh, where the gap is. It's that, you know, you gain a lot, but it's all about how you're able to relay that to the employer. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like, just, can I just add one sure. thing about, um, um, I can't remember which one of them said it, but about the grit, so just to the don't give up, you know, you can reapply. And I think that's absolutely the case. We definitely have um, seen applications where someone has um, not been successful the first time. And then I see, you know, they've reapplied the next year or perhaps two years later, and then they are selected. I mean, we've taken people who have applied um, on their third um, time. So it's, um, you know, sometimes it's, it, it's definitely worth um, reapplying. Now I'm in the, in the process of doing that, I would reach out to the program that you're interested in and try to, to learn more about, um, you know, what maybe your, the gaps have been in your application in the past. I think that there are definitely people that are willing to uh, kind of help men mentor you through the process. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left and we have a whole bunch of questions that came in. Um, I'm just want to make two comments. So one is knowing how to frame your experience is so important. And I look at thousands of resumes and a lot of times people say I had a fellowship. No details about the result, the impact of what they did. And particularly if it's a lesser known fellowship, you know, might, even a university fellowship. I mean, I've seen people say I had a fellowship and I asked them how much was the fellowship for and they said they paid my full tuition for grad school. So if it's a lesser known fellowship, list the dollar amount in your resume if it's Fulbright or born people will know that but a lot of times it's like if it's a thousand dollar fellowship I wouldn't list the amount but knowing how to frame your experience is so important and IIE recently came out with a study as part of their generation study abroad about surveying alum about how it helped their career so please look up IIE and the study on generation study abroad and kind of the work that kind of the connection between fellowships and work and skills because it's a wonderful document um, so the three, and, and also one other thing in terms of fellowships for social change, there's a wonderful event for people who might be in DC on November 8th called the Impact Fellowships Summit. And it's all, it's a convening of about 60 of the top impact fellowship programs in the country. So Rotary is going to be there. I'll be there. I don't, I, I think I'm boring staff from DC are going to be from IIE, but it's really like all the fellowship programs coming together, mostly professional ones. And, and there's so many out there. So look up the Impact Fellowship summit. I'll, I'll put the link on before we finish. So I'll, I'll read off the three questions and ask the speakers to respond to any or all of them. So the first one is any particular fellowships you would highlight for career switchers or people over 35, so kind of in the mid-career level. Um, second question, if your college doesn't have an alumni network for people who've had fellowships, how do you go about finding advice? And I think, I think Laura talked a lot about that, but you might have some other questions. And then the third question, does it matter if you have a six-month fellowship or a 12-month fellowship? Does it, would a grad school or fellowship program look any differently on the, the length of a fellowship? So, so the three questions, career switchers, um, how do you find alumni from your university who may, if there's no alum network for fellowships, and the six versus 12-month, you know, any difference of how employers or other fellowship programs mm -hmm. view that? Any, anyone want to start? I'd be happy to speak to the career switchers because I think um, the Rotary Peace Program does get some career switchers, um, especially people who are going, who've been working in um, the private sector and um, want to um, maybe take the skills that they've developed, which may be, you know, business skills. Um, they may have been working in the legal field, but always in the private sector, and they would like to, you know, take those skills, but, but um, figure out ways to um, change and, and switch directions, um, you know, and, and I think a fellowship is a really good example of how you could do that, but at the same time, you know, we, I think we've said this like 20 times um, in the past hour is that it's really how you, you tell the story. Um, and so, you know, I think it's, 
there are a lot of fellowships that would be good as people want to shift um, shift their careers and it's just figuring out how you can uh, make the case for that. Yeah, ab absolutely. I would, I would also add that you probably, or for most scholarships um, and fellowships, if you are thinking about a career switch, the scholarship and fellowship can't be the first step that you've taken in that career switch. That you need to kind of highlight other skills and experience, volunteer internships, um, other ways that you have already kind of started to put your toe in that water to again kind of show that this is something that you're committed to rather than kind of a whim um, with no with no backup e experience. Um, I would encourage those of you who might be at kind of more of a mid stage in your career to look at the Fulbright Scholar Program, um, which sometimes is a little bit of a misnomer um, because a lot of people think it just relates to people with PhDs, but that's not true. Um, so the Fulbright Student Program is for people pre-PhD and who are early career professionals, but if you are more of a mid-career professional, I would encourage you to look at the Fulbright Scholar Program, um, as that does have opportunities um, for folks kind of more advanced or, or mid-level mid in, their, in their careers. Um, I want to jump in and talk for a minute about the alumni network, and I'll defer to the expert here. Um, if your institution or your alma mater doesn't have a network to be connected to, that's okay. Most scholarships and fellowships will have a group of their alumni, regardless of what institution that they went to, um, that you can reach out to. Sometimes those names are, are publicized on the website. I know Fulbright has a full uh, database going back to the inception of the program um, of anyone who's had one, and you can do a little bit of social media stocking. I mean networking um, to uh, connect with people who have had the had the, have had the scholarship or fellowship in the past. Remember, these people were chosen for this experience. They went on this experience. Hopefully, it was a positive experience. So, reaching out to someone over LinkedIn, over Facebook, to say, you know, I'm interested in going to. South Africa on a Fulbright. I saw that you had one last year. You know, do you mind talking to me a little bit about your experience? Can I do an informational interview with you? Um, I think people respond really, really well to that. So, um, so certainly you want to be using the alumni connections at your alma mater, but also be thinking about the alumni connections from the program that are not institution specific. Uh, yes, most most of the alumni fellowships that at least IE organizes there are official associations that have been created. There's the Fulbright Association. I know Boren has an alumni association. But then there's also LinkedIn groups that a lot of them are secure, but you just request to join. And then you can, you know, ask the whole gamut of folks for advice and connect with them. Um, and most of these associations have websites where you can, you know, see where people did their fellowships and ask for advice, just like Laura pointed out. Um, so I definitely encourage you to look on the web to see if there are official associations. And then there are also informal associations that some of the alums have started themselves. For example, we used to uh, administer this one Bulgarian uh, Young Leaders program, which is amazing. And the alums from that, um, from that program actually created their own association. And they have this amazing website online, and you can connect with them. So I would say most, most fellowships and programs, if they, there's not an official association, there's some sort of association online. Um, the last question, and Susan, I don't mean to be not monopolizing the, the yeah. screen here. The last question, I think, was about six versus 12 months of, mm -hmm. of a fellowship. And I think that if you are kind of weighing the options of multiple opportunities or thinking about applying to multiple opportunities, some things that you're going to want to think about are, first and foremost, are any of the options deferrable? Right? So if you are applying to multiple things and you receive multiple things, can you either stack them concurrently or is one deferrable so that you can take advantage of one opportunity and then kind of come back from that and, and join another opportunity? I think with regard to the length of a fellowship, there's no kind of right answer. Everyone is going to be at a different phase of their life, how much time they feel like they can dedicate to this. And just like we are talking about telling your, your story and your past experiences in a fellowship application, when you are kind of promoting yourself to future employers, thinking about putting this on a resume or a CV, the length of a fellowship doesn't necessarily kind of a 12-month fellowship doesn't look twice as good as a six-month fellowship if the 12-month fellowship isn't talked about in a cover letter or, or in your kind of resume in a way that makes sense to the job that you're undertaking. So if you are weighing multiple options for multiple lengths of time, um, I don't think necessarily the length of time matters as much as how much you feel like it will impact you and put you on the trajectory that you would like to see, and then how you are presenting yourself to future employers or other additional scholarships and fellowships uh, long term. Um, so thank you very much for the wonderful wisdom. So I, what I'd like to do is just 
sum up and ask you one last very quick question. So just to summarize, this will be posted online. Um, IIE and Rotary and most fellowship administrators or programs have great resources you can find. Opportunities, deadlines, strategies, use alum networks, do your preparation, do not apply the day before. It's just not worth it. <laughs> be, 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 be nice to your referrers, ask them in advance. Make, basically your goal is to make everyone's life easier that you're inconveniencing by applying for the fellowship, including the reader. So they just want to be wowed. They just put all the pieces together. Like if your motto is, I want, I'm qualified for this, I want to make it as easy as possible, connect the dots, do everything in advance, get feedback, don't, you know, don't, don't just submit it without having other people read it. Prepare for interviews, we didn't even talk about that, that's a whole other strategy. Um, but like think through the different processes, we're likely to be more successful. Um, so uh, again, this, this session was sponsored by Rotary Peace Fellowship. Please check them out, they're amazing. Please check out IE. They have a wonderful amount of fellowship programs. And my last question, just for 30 seconds, is apart from your own programs that you administer or run, what's the most exciting fellowship program that you would recommend others apply for? Or if you were going to apply for a <laughs> if you're going to apply for a fellowship today or your earlier self, like what would you have wished you could have applied for? Apart from your own program. Uh, apart from my own program. Wow. Uh, I think I definitely would have applied, would have, if I was going to do it all over again, I would apply for the Fulbright. Yeah. There's still time. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was well, never, never too late. Uh, okay. Never too late to apply I'll, for the Fulbright. I'll check it out. <laughs> Um, outside of IIE sponsored programs, I'm always really impressed with the Watson um, Foundation and the work that they're doing. They have a great scholarship um, for, for students at 50 undergraduate uh, campuses, but they're also running a program now for students um, to get them involved in internships in the summers between their freshman and sophomore, sophomore and junior and junior and I think junior and senior year um, to help them be more competitive in the in the workforce. So I'm always a big a big fan of, of their work and, and their uh, impact in the world. Mm -hmm. I would say the Erasmus, Erasmus Mundus program. A lot of people don't. It's the European version of Fulbright. I would, mm -hmm. I would say you can actually apply to it, get a master's degree in Europe if you live outside of the European Union. Um, it's specific. You have to look into the exact type of master's degree that you want to get, but you can actually attend three different European universities to get your master's degree. really fun. Yeah. Okay. Um, so thank you very much again. Um, also just put in a plug for other fellowship resources. So again, IIE, Rotary, there's tons on PCDN. ProFellow is another great database of fellowship opportunities. Um, and, and literally there's so many. Open Society is another very good one. They administer a lot, I think. Go ahead. Yeah, um, Craig, can I jump in really quickly sure. and just say, I know that, scholar, that, that off scholarships and fellowships offices on college campuses um, uh, there's some drastic differences in what they're able to provide, but some of the major um, power players in the U.S. higher education system have put together kind of almost comprehensive lists of scholarships and fellowships out there that are open source. So um, they're not locked only for students at those universities. So um, if you do do some Googling and come across a, you know, a kind of a scholarships and fellowship website for somewhere that's not your alma mater, that's fine um, to be able to look at the opportunities that are available as well. And then just one fellowship program I runs that's not as well known as Scholars at Risk. So if anybody knows people who are academics in countries where they're under threat, I basically run one of the coolest fellowships in the world where they help temporarily move people whose lives are at risk. It's a competitive wow. fellowship to countries where they can be safe and continue their work. Um, so yeah. it's one of the, I think it's one of the cooler, newer fellowships. And then none of us have talked about the Nike fellows. I don't know what's happening with that, but Phil Knight, the founder of Nike, gave, I think, $500 million to Stanford. And I'm still waiting for the mm -hmm. fellowship program to be announced. Mm -hmm. um, right. so, so thank you everyone for taking time thank out of you. your schedule, all our participants for listening, and have a wonderful day. And this will be online by next week. Thank Perfect. you, Perfect. Thanks so much for having Thanks. us. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Bye. Great. Thanks, Susan.